Today on Cook's Country, Brian makes Julia authentic South Carolina smoked fresh ham. Adam reviews the best potato mashers with Bridget. Jack challenges Julia to a tasting of spiral sliced bone in ham. And Christy makes Bridget the ultimate smashed potato salad. It's all right here on Cook's Country. The first 13 pigs to ever set trotter in the New World. Well, they were brought by Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto back in 1525. Today, the U.S. produces more than 110 million hogs. That's a lot of hogs. <laughs> and more than 2.8 billion pounds of ham every single year. Now, most folks are well acquainted with cooking a spiral sliced ham, which represents nearly half of all the ham consumed in the U.S. But today, we're working with a raw, also known as a green ham. No green eggs today, though. And a place that really knows how to make the most out of fresh ham, that's Heights Barbecue in West Columbia, South Carolina. We headed down to the Palmetto State to learn how to barbecue from the owner himself, David Height. The key to that savory South Carolina fresh ham is that crackling skin, and today Brian's gonna show us how to make it. But of course, it starts with buying the right cut of pork. So here we have a pork shoulder, also known as a Boston butt. And this is the traditional cut that you use to make pulled pork. But if you notice, there's no skin on here. This is just a layer of fat. And what they use at Heights is the leg. That's right, they prefer a fresh ham. And right here, I have an entire leg of pork. When you go grocery shopping, you have two options typically. You have a shank end here that you can see has a lot of nice skin. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing for us. And you also have a sirloin end. There's a lot of meat on this, but not as much skin. Today, because we're after that crackling crisp skin, we're gonna go with the shank end. All right. To start, we're going to salt this with about two tablespoons of kosher salt. We're doing it on a couple of sheets of plastic wrap, so when we wrap it all, the salt stays really stuck to the meat. So we'll just salt this all over. Now that it's all salted, we're gonna wrap it up. I heard this rumor, I have no idea if it's true, uh -huh. that the left leg of the pig is more tender than the right <laughs> leg of the pig. You've never heard of no, this. No, <laughs> I've never heard that. But how about this? I guarantee you, left or right leg, this is gonna be a very tender cut of pork and nice crispy skin. I'll take it. <laughs> okay. We'll refrigerate this for about 18 to 24 hours, okay? We've had this ham salting for 24 hours, and now we're ready to put it on the grill. But first, we have to set the grill up. So we have four and a half quarts of lit charcoal briquettes here. We're just gonna pour that evenly over half of the grill. We just scatter the coals around. And then on top of the coals, we're gonna put a wood chip packet. And there's two cups of hickory wood chips that have been soaked in water for about 15 minutes. And soaking the wood chips in water kind of slows down the burn. The foil packet also helps delay the burn. And it also keeps the chips contained when they're on the coals. Put the grate in place. We'll cover the grill and let those chips begin to smoke, which takes about five minutes. The grill looks like it's beginning to smoke. Oh, that smells good. We're gonna go ahead and scrape the grill grate clean, and then we're gonna oil it lightly. And this is always good to do, to clean the grill right after you heat it up, before you start cooking, and give it a good swipe of oil, because that's how you maintain a good grill. Right. And we're ready to put the ham Ooh, on the grill. Oh, I like, you're just putting your hand on the ham. Yeah. Well, I noticed you put that flesh side down. Yeah, you wanna put it on there cut side down. And then it's important to notice that the bottom grill vents are open mm -hmm. and the top grill vents are also open. That's gonna give a draft so the smoke will come out of that packet and travel across the ham as it exits the grill. Ah, it kisses the ham before exactly, it leaves the grill. Exactly, exactly. So this period, which takes about two hours, is not really about cooking the ham through, it's just about imparting that hickory smoke flavor. Julia, it's been two hours, so we can take a look at our ham. Ooh, I can't help myself. The skin's not so crisp yet, though. Right, not yet. It'll get crisp. We have you a promised few... me, man. <laughs> I know, I promised. <laughs> we have a few tricks up our sleeves, but first we're going to transfer this ham to a 9 by 13 pan. Wow, that's gorgeous. We're going to cover it with foil, but before we do that, we want to put this little guard on here, because as this ham cooks, the bone will start to poke up, and sometimes it'll rip through the foil there. By covering this ham with foil, we're trapping heat and we're trapping moisture. That moisture is going to help soften the skin. All right, so softening it makes a little bit of sense, but that's not going to help it be crisp at all. Right, not yet. Now it's just about tenderizing that skin so we can then crisp it later. All right, I'm trusting you. Okay, Julia, so we've got all the smoke on this little piggy that we need after the last <laughs> two hours on the grill. So we're ready to throw it in the oven at 300 degrees for about two and a half hours until it's nice and tender. In the barbecue world, a lot of people will say that great barbecue doesn't need a sauce because there's nothing to hide. However, South Carolina really owns the barbecue sauce realm. 
If you go into any barbecue joint, you'll find four separate sauces on the table, each representing a particular region of South Carolina huh. in the style of barbecue that they four make. Four sauces. Four sauces. It's a four sauce state. <laughs> in the center of the state, around Columbia, and on down to the southern tip of the state, is the mustard sauce. This happens to be one of the best sauces, in my opinion, because it really amplifies the flavor of the pork, lets the smokiness come through. So I have one and a half cups of plain yellow mustard. To that, I'll add half a cup of cider vinegar, six tablespoons of brown sugar, two tablespoons of ketchup, two teaspoons of hot sauce, two teaspoons of Worcestershire sauce, and one teaspoon of pepper. And we'll just whisk this together. And another great thing about this sauce is there's no cooking involved. So you just whisk <laughs> it together and you're all done. This ham has been in the oven for two and a half hours. Oh. And we're going to take its temp to make sure it's around 200 degrees. Okay, at this point in development, we hoped we could just throw the ham back in the oven and the skin would get nice and crispy and beautiful, but it didn't work. All right. There's too much moisture beneath the skin for it to really crisp up. And we decided that we would remove the skin. Sometimes the skin splits on its own and, oh, yeah, and starts like to right peel there. back. Right. Other times we just have to give it a little bit of a nudge with a paring knife. So this is nice and luscious. Oh, look at that. One giant piece. Hey, Joey, we have the skin on the tray fat side down, so that fat renders and the skin gets nice and crispy. Mm, I'm looking forward to that part. I'm gonna throw it in a 400 degree oven for 25 minutes to roast up. And while I'm doing that, why don't you cover the ham with the foil so it keeps warm while the roast is off? You bet. Okay, Julia, here is your Whoa. crispy skin. Whoa. You can see how it's bubbled up yeah. nicely, it's crisp. And you can actually hear when it's crisp. It makes it nice. Oh, that hollow sound. Oh my goodness. So we're gonna let that cool down, and as it cools, more steam will escape and it'll get even crispier. So let's turn our attention to the pork. This has been resting for about 30 minutes. Hello, beautiful. And we could go ahead and transfer this to our carving board. You see we have all these juices remaining in the pan here, and we wanna save that because we're gonna add it back at the end to our chopped pork. We're first gonna remove any of the exterior chunks of fat that are still on there. And then we're going to remove the bones. You see how tender the meat is? It just oh, kind just, of falls apart. Yeah, it's just falling away from that bone. Oh, man. <laughs> the aroma coming off of this bone of this smoked ham is amazing. OK, in South Carolina and certain parts of North Carolina, when you walk into any barbecue joint, you always hear this pop, 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 pop. This noise of somebody back there with a couple of cleavers going to town on half a hog <laughs> or a couple of fresh hams that have just come off the pit. You want to be that guy. That's my dream job. <laughs> so <laughs> auditioning for the position of pit master day, <laughs> Brian Roof. So it's kind of like playing drums. Okay, that just looks like fun. <laughs> now that the pork is chopped up, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and chop our crackling skin. I'm waiting for this. And we just want to kind of cut small pieces. Oh my goodness. That is like the best part of bacon, that little fat crispy edge along the bottom. That's amazing. Now we're ready to add this crackling <laughs> to the pork. And this is what is really going to set this pork apart from typical pulled pork. I believe it. We're going to go ahead and microwave these juices so they're nice and hot when we add them to the pork. All right, I'm going to stand here. <laughs> That is the most beautiful bowl of pork I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> you say that to everybody. <laughs> and we'll just give this a toss. These are potato rolls, and these are the best. A little bit of that mustard sauce. Oh, yeah. More than a little. Cheers. Cheers. As they say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mm. love the crunchy bits in there. Goodness. See how that mustard sauce doesn't cover up the flavor of the pork? Not at all. It really just enhances it a little. Mm hmm And you can taste a lot of that smoke flavor and all those juices keep that meat so moist and tender. Mm. Mm. This is good, Brian. Thank you. To make this stunner of a smoked ham at home, along with those killer cracklins, start by salt rubbing a shank end green ham. 
Smoke the ham on the grill over wood chips, then finish cooking it in the oven. The best part of this ham is the crisp, bacon-like skin that's removed from the cooked ham in one piece and returned to the oven to finish cooking on its own till it's good and crisp. Toss the chopped up meat and those cracklins with a mustard-based barbecue sauce, and there you have it, the best shredded pork sandwich ever. So from Cook's Country, the ultimate recipe for South Carolina smoked fresh ham. Hi, Julia. All right, so today we're going to be tasting ham, which is one of the oldest and most popular cured pork products in the world. In fact, it's so old that there was a man named Cato the Elder who wrote about making ham in Roman times. But today we have Jack the Younger, who is going to show <laughs> us which supermarket ham tastes best. I promise, none of these are 2,000 years old. <laughs> That's good. So why did you start tasting? These are spiral sliced hams. All right. The audience, by the way, has already sampled these. They've already figured out which one is the best, and they agree with the expert panel and chose mm, the winner. Okay. These have already been smoked and cooked. You're really basically just warming the ham, and if it's already been sliced, you don't have any work to do. Big difference here is the balance between the four key flavors. So the four key flavors here are meatiness, smoke, salt, and sweetness. Okay. Second thing is textural differences. So these are all wet cured. So that means they're either soaked in a brine or injected with a brine. And then they're tumbled. And so they have huge like industrial dryers that they put these hams in and they tumble them for really? two to 24 hours. It's tenderizing the meat. Oh. And it's also working in the brine, but it also forces out liquid and it can make them dry. That was a big factor in our ratings. So anything that you're noticing here yeah. as you were tasting these, what differences you were mm -hmm. picking up? Definitely some textural differences, and one in particular, this one, was overwhelmingly salty. The salt was just blocked out the other meaty flavors. So this was my least favorite by far. Okay. This one, was definitely over tumbled. But it was, <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing there, of course. But this one was a bit dry. It was a bit mealy when I ate it. But this ham, on the other hand, the flavor was nicely imbalanced. It was moist and it was juicy, but it wasn't spongy, which I'm also very wary of. So this was by far my favorite, and these two, not even close. So what do you want to start with? Uh, let's start with Mr. Salty. Okay. You chose the Cook's Spiral Sliced Ham. Okay. This was in the middle of the pack. It has the most salt, yeah. by far. It's 50% more salt than the other brands, and it tastes very salty. All right, what about Mr. Dry? This is the Honey Baked, and the texture was, I think, suboptimal here. Uh, this is also the sweetest ham, but people who love a really sweet ham gravitated to this, despite the fact that it's a little drier. Okay, and this guy, then? Julia chose the winner. All right. Uh, you agree with the studio audience? This is from North Carolina, Johnston County. We thought it had the perfect balance of salt, smoke, uh, sweetness, and that porky deliciousness that makes ham such a great favorite. All right, so there you have it. The brand of ham really does make a difference. And for our money, well, we're going with Johnston County Spiral Sliced Ham. <laughs> I love potatoes so much that I don't let my postage stamp size yard stop me from growing my own. And one year, I grew 40 pounds of spuds. We had all kinds, banana fingerlings, rose fins, one of my favorites, and German butterballs. Now I've got two favorite potato dishes, and one is creamy mashed potatoes. But I also love chunky potato salad. And Christy, luckily, is here to show me how I can enjoy both of my favorites in one very southern dish. Well, this isn't mashed potato salad. It's okay. smashed potato salad. And the difference? Well, that's what we had to figure out first. <laughs> what exactly <laughs> was mashed potato salad? Some versions that we found put all of the cooked potatoes into a stand mixer, pureed the whole bunch, and left us with cold whipped potatoes with mayonnaise. It was a little weird. And then other versions used a food mill or a ricer, but they kind of gave us the same effect with more dishes to wash. Okay. So we wanted a more rustic approach. We wanted to leave the skins on for a little texture, and we also wanted to have a blend of textures in the potato itself. So okay. some chunks, some smooth, creamy mash. Best of both worlds. Yes. All so right. I have three pounds of Yukon okay. Gold potatoes. I'm gonna add these to my Dutch oven with eight cups of water. and a tablespoon of salt. 
Now we had to work against our instincts here. Usually we're trying <laughs> to keep the potatoes really intact. Sure. But for smashed potato salad, we can actually cook the potatoes until they're fully tender. And that's gonna take about 15 minutes on medium heat after the potatoes have come to a boil. You wanna get just the right amount of fall apart ability? Exactly. <laughs> I'm in complete control work. here, Bridget. She is in complete control <laughs> and I'm in awe. <laughs> Potatoes have been simmering for about 15 minutes, so we're gonna get them out of the pot quickly so they don't overcook. All right, now, we tried smashing the whole pot. We had much better results when we mashed just a portion of the potatoes and left the rest in chunks. So that's what we're gonna do. Just gonna transfer three cups of my cooked potatoes to a big bowl. So I have a tablespoon of distilled white vinegar that I'll add while they're nice and hot. Just work out your aggression. And these, you really want to get completely mashed. Okay. And now we have the rest of the potatoes that I'll just transfer to a baking sheet. And we want to keep these in nice big chunks. I'm going to season these as well with another tablespoon of vinegar. Great. That smells so good. We'll just set these potatoes aside and it's helpful to let them cool to room temperature. This should only take about 15 minutes. Okay. Now it's time to start on our dressing. It's a mayonnaise-based dressing, but we want something really bright and tangy this time. So in addition to the one cup of mayonnaise I have, I'm gonna add three tablespoons of yellow mustard. Yellow mustard is superior to all other mustards, in my opinion. <laughs> it's so sunshiny. It even makes it look sunshiny. I'm gonna add half a cup of water to loosen up this dressing. Now I wanna season this as well. So I have a teaspoon of salt, teaspoon of pepper, mm -hmm and a quarter teaspoon of cayenne. Wee doggy. <laughs> That's not gonna make it spicy, it's just gonna add a little kick. I'm gonna add this to my mashed potatoes. I could eat that right now. We'll just get this mixed in. We'll set this aside for right now. All right. We've added all of our seasonings, but now we wanna add some texture to this. I have half a cup of sweet pickle. We just wanted to have a little bit of sweet, just a little bit, to balance out all of that bright tanginess. All right. So I'm just gonna chop these kind of roughly. All right, that looks good. Now, we also wanted to add some freshness in the form of scallions. So I'm going to add three scallions to the mix. They add color. We're using the whites and the green parts. We have a quarter cup of finely chopped onion and half a cup of finely chopped celery. And then I've got three hard cooked eggs that I've chopped up. And now we'll add the rest of the potatoes, the chunks that we've left. You know, we kind of glossed over those hard cooked eggs, but they are a game changer. They're so easy to peel. Mm -hmm. So we cleverly call them our easy peel. Hard cooked <laughs> eggs, and for that recipe, you can just go to the website. Now I'm gonna mix this a little gingerly. I don't wanna be too rough because we've worked pretty hard to keep those textures Constant. I love that you included me in it. You've done all the work. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to overmix it. It should still be kind of lumpy and kind of chunky. Now I'm just going to cover this with some plastic and we'll chill this. I don't have to chill it for about two hours. But that's going to help <laughs> all of these wonderful flavors meld together and it'll taste fabulous. All right, worth the wait. Can a handheld potato masher really make creamy, smooth spuds? Well, Adam's here to tell us which potato masher smashed the competition. <laughs> Good one, Bridget, I like that. Well, you know that the problem with these handheld mashers in the old days is that the spuds could come out kind of lumpy, kind of <laughs> gluey, yes. not a great texture. Mm -mm. There are some new models on the market they have innovative designs, and that got us wondering, gee, are those gonna make the creamy, smooth mashed potatoes <laughs> of our dreams? So we gathered this lineup of 15 different potato mashers. The price range was a low of about $7 up to $30. And they fall into three general designs. In front of you, you have the innovative ones that ah. we thought might be the answer to our mashed potato texture problem. These are the ones like our grandmothers had. They have the wavy wire tines like that. Mm -hmm. And then these are also an old design. These have a perforated mashing plate. What's up with this one? <laughs> <laughs> that's actually the gear shift from a Rambler. Oops, how did I get <laughs> exactly. that one in there? <laughs> it won't go out of reverse, that's the problem. 
<laughs> and then that green one, Tester's likened that to a pogo stick. Yeah, it reminds me of one of those burger presses, too. Yeah, no, yeah. it really, it didn't make the greatest mashed potatoes. That one, the star tip, who knows what yes. the story there is. It makes is. flower-shaped potatoes. This turned into <laughs> an elimination round. The ah. flower one, the pogo stick, the gear shift, and these three, we got rid of all of them. That left us a final lineup of these nine mashers. Testers took this final lineup and mashed the starchier russet potatoes, softer sweet potatoes, and another round of the Yukon gold potatoes. And pretty quickly they developed a preference for the type that had the perforated mashing head, just because they were easier and more efficient to use and the texture of the potatoes was smoother. Of course, they also paid attention to the handles. They much preferred a more generous handle. This one is about five to six inches. You can see that it's rubber, mm -hmm. it's easier to grip, and it's angled. That also helped with the mashing action. This is our new favorite <laughs> handheld potato masher. This is the Xylus stainless steel potato masher. It's $12.99, so it's not a huge investment. Mm -hmm. And it's got everything we like. It's got a perforated mashing head with lots of holes of the right size. It's got a comfy handle, and it produced potatoes with a lovely velvety smooth texture. Well, there you go. Our winner is the Xylus stainless steel potato masher, again, for $12.99. Thanks, Adam. Our salad is chilled for two hours. I've been chilling as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. There we go. Picnic style. Really, really cool texture, I have to say. Most of that creaminess is the potato. You taste tons of potato mm -hmm. in this. And I will say that that cayenne, I get it. it uh -huh. It's there. It makes the option of a beer very nice at your picnic, right? Mm. And the sweet pickles just kind of pop up a little bit, give you a nice sweet edge to that tanginess. Well, if you'd like to make the very best smashed potato salad at home, well, you're gonna have to start with potatoes. Yukon Golds are perfect because they hold their shape and they break down just enough to give you a nice creamy texture. And rustic, well, that's code for, you can leave the peels on. Smash a third of the cooked potatoes, create your own sweet and tangy dressing with mayo, yellow mustard, and sweet pickles. Scallions for freshness, hard-cooked eggs for richness, and celery for a great crunch. Fold them into the rest of the potatoes. There you have it from Cook's Country, the best recipe for a smashed potato salad you will ever find. And you can find this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and select episodes at our website, cookscountry.com. Smashing job. <laughs> You've been waiting. Been waiting for years to say that one. <laughs> Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>